The simple truth is this. All of us have a purpose that drives us. All of us have a mission by which we live our lives. It, it might not be verbalized. You might not have it written down. You might not have it as a plaque when you enter into your home. But all of us have a mission or a purpose which drives us. The question this morning, very honestly, is not whether you have a purpose statement or whether you have a mission statement, because all of us do, whether you realize it or not. The question is this, does the goals that you have set for your life match God's goals for your life? Think about that again. Do the goals, does, does the goal that, that you have set for your life, does it match God's goal for your life? In other words, do, does your mission statement match His? In, in today's passage, we get to read the mission statement of Jesus Christ. You say, Brian, you mean Jesus has a purpose statement? Jesus has a mission statement? He most certainly does, and he quotes it. He alludes to it in the passage that we're looking at today. And, and the cool thing about this mission statement, Jesus' mission statement, is that he didn't write it. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? It was written by the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years before Jesus lived. And as Jesus begins his ministry, he takes this this message, these words of Isaiah, and he applies them to himself. And he says, this is my mission statement. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Luke chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 14. I'll put it up on the screen. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. You follow along in the translation that you have. Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. Then Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. If you underline in your Bibles, that's a great phrase to underline, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. By the way, let me pause there because you'll find in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he was praised by everyone. And the latter part of his ministry, he was what? He was criticized by almost everyone and eventually crucified. Verse 16, when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Let me just pause there. That's a great phrase. He went as usual. His custom was, even though he was God himself, his custom was what? To go to God's house on the Sabbath day. I trust that's your custom as well. He went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released. Why? That the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Notice verse 20. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked intently at him. Then he began to speak to them. This is what Jesus said. The scripture that you have just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you so much for the time of worship that we had this morning. Thank you that Bernita was able to be back with us. Father, we think through the songs that we sang, we sang today, 10,000 reasons, so many reasons for which we should lift our voices and praise you. You've given us far more, much more than we could ever, ever deserve, and we praise you. Lord, when we think about your grace, we are speechless. If we're not, we don't understand the grace of God, the fact that you give us what we could never, ever deserve. We're grateful for that. 
And yes, your grace is amazing. Thank you that you're our healer, both physically and spiritually. Thank you that you love us and you come into our lives and and you fix what we mess up. God, I pray that you would allow us or help us to allow you to be the healer of our lives. And so as we look at your word today, I pray that you'd teach us, encourage us, challenge us, help us to examine our mission, to make sure that we are on mission with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a quick review. We're going through the book of Luke, investigating Jesus, and just to kind of give a synopsis of the first six or seven weeks, here's the three things that we've basically seen. Basically, we've seen that Jesus' miraculous birth proves that he is fully God. Remember that Luke is writing to Theophilus, and the purpose of writing is to, is to prove the, the deity and the divinity of Jesus Christ, and he begins with the miraculous virgin birth, and we've seen that Jesus is birth, as miraculous as it was, demonstrates that he was God in the flesh, that he was God incarnate, that Jesus is fully God. Last week we were in Luke chapter 4, the first 13 verses, and we studied the temptation of Jesus. And we were reminded of the fact that that his comprehensive, all-inclusive temptation proves that he was not only fully God, but that he was fully man. We, we call Jesus the, the God-man. He wasn't 50% God and 50% man. No, he was fully God, 100% God. And at the same time, he was fully man, 100% man. He was tempted in every way, just like you and me. He was man. He went through what you and I go through. But if you studied that passage last week, he was victorious over the devil. And even though he was tempted, he didn't give in to the temptation. He was completely victorious. And the writer of Hebrews says that though he was tempted like us, yet he never, ever sinned. And his complete triumph over the devil proves that victory is possible for us. And and I want us to grab a hold of that truth this morning. Victory is possible for us. Whatever it is that you're struggling with today, whether it's an addiction, whether it's a, a personal problem, whether it's a sin problem in your life, whether it's an anger problem, whatever it is, Jesus is the answer. And victory is possible for you and for me. And so, two questions this morning as we look at this passage of Scripture that I would like for us to consider. The first is this, what does this passage say about Jesus Christ? What does it teach us about Jesus? And the second thing is this, what does this passage teach us about us? Or in other words, as we study Him, and as we study His mission statement, what does it teach us about us, and what the purpose of our lives is? should be. And so notice a couple of things. I've put them in your notes. The first is this. Like Jesus, you and I should be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let me remind you, the first verse that we read is verse 14 that says this, then Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. I find it incredibly interesting that this week's passage begins just like last week's passage. If you go back with me to chapter 1 of verse 4, I'd remind you how verse 1 of chapter 4 began. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. In both instances, we find that Jesus was filled, led, and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Once again, I would remind you, if we can speak of theology and Christology for just a moment, you might sit back and say, well, Brian, piece of cake for Jesus, he was God. And the Bible says that God cannot be tempted. Well, Philippians chapter 2 tells us that Jesus voluntarily laid aside his divine privileges and the victory that Jesus won over sin was won through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, Jesus confronted those temptations just like you and I confront those temptations. And it was the Holy Spirit's power that enabled him to be victorious. That, by the way, is how you and I are victorious. 
The only way that you are ever going to be victorious over sin, the only way that I'm ever going to be victorious over sin is by allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to be demonstrated through our lives. You might sit back and say, okay, Brian, what in the world does that mean? How in the world can I possess the power of the Holy Spirit? How can I allow His power to flow through me? I wrote down two things in my notes, then you're in your notes. The first is this. The Holy Spirit empowers those that live holy. The Holy Spirit empowers those that live holy. We see that in Jesus' life. Although in the first 13 verses, he was tempted in every way like us. And please, once again, let me reiterate what I spoke on last week. Let's not think that he had three simple temptations that he overcame, and that was it. He was tempted all of his life, and he was attacked in an unbelievable way. For 40 days as he was there in the desert, he went through an unbelievable spiritual battle. But he won that battle. And he came out victorious. And we rejoice in the fact today that we serve a sinless Savior. A Savior that never, ever sinned. And so, just as the power of the Holy Spirit was demonstrated through His holy life, the power of the Holy Spirit will be demonstrated through your holy life and through my holy life. You see, his holy, his sinless and holy life was the conduit through which the power of the Holy Spirit could flow. You see, here's just a simple application. Whenever there's sin in our lives, sin corrodes, sin corrupts, sin clogs our lives so that the power of the Holy Spirit cannot be demonstrated through us. Here's just a simple demonstration that I brought today. These are just a couple of uh, syringes that we have lying around the house. One of them is kind of uh, filled with all kinds of gunk and dirt and all of that. And the idea of a syringe like this is to pour something through it and, and for water for the fluid to come out on the other end. We get that, right? And so let me illustrate this morning without making a mess if I can. All right, you pour water in this and what happens? Nothing happens. Why? We've poured water in, but what happens? There, there's, there's something that's clogging it. There's something that's keeping that water from flowing through. Why? There's dirt in there. There's, there's corruption in there. Something that's keeping it clogged. Whereby, on the other hand, you take one of a syringe that's absolutely clean, and what happens? That water freely flows right through it. You see, simple illustration, but that's what takes place in your life and in my life. Whenever we allow sin to come into our life and that sin is unconfessed and that sin begins to clod up and that sin begins to clog up in our life and we allow that sin to live there, what does it do? It stops the flow of the power of the Holy Spirit of God through us. You sit back and say, man, Brian, I can't figure out why in the world I'm not victorious. Is there a sin in your life that's dominating your life? Are you allowing sin to live in your life with, without confessing it? Are you living a life that honors and pleases God? You see, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit comes to those that live holy. The second thing I would say is this, that the power of the Holy Spirit is given to those that surrender completely. Surrender completely. We often sing that song, I surrender all. Here's just a couple of verses from it. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. You see, we see Jesus was victorious, and He's mentioned frequently throughout the book of Luke as being empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Why is that? His life was holy, and He surrendered to God completely. 
Man, what a challenge. We could kind of stop right there, say amen. I'm not going to, but we could stop right there. And there's enough meat, there's enough application in that for us to chew on the rest of the week. You see, in order for us to demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit of God, we must live a holy life. We must be surrendered. Have you truly surrendered all? Is there anything that you are holding back, anything in your life that that you know does not please God, but you just can't release it? You like it too much. You get too much pleasure out of it. Holy Spirit power is given to those who live holy and surrender completely. The second thing that we see in, in the passage, and I believe it's the major part of the text that we're looking at today, is like Jesus, you and I must be dedicated to the mission. We must know what our mission is, and we must be dedicated to that mission. Let me paint a picture of what's taking place in the first few verses before we get to the passage that Jesus stood up and read. read. Here in Luke chapter 4, Jesus returns to his boyhood home of Nazareth. Why? He was returning home. And as Jesus walked into Nazareth, as he'd been away for a while, no doubt he received warm embraces, probably even kisses on the cheek. Merchants called his name. Why? Why, look who's there. That's that's Jesus. Why, that's Joseph's son. That's the carpenter's son. Merchants would call his name. Everyone probably knew him. Why, Jesus was their native son. Jesus returns to Nazareth, and on the Sabbath, as is his custom, he walks into the Jewish synagogue. The Jewish synagogue, by the way, was was the center of Jewish community life. And Jesus walked in on that Saturday ready to participate in that Jewish worship service. Now, I would warn you that Jewish worship services in New Testament times were much different than our services today. You'd sit back and say, okay, Brian, what are the differences? Well, first of all, those services generally lasted all day long. Now, can you imagine coming to church and sitting here all day long? Sometimes we maybe complain that the service goes an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and 20 minutes. During Jesus' day, they lasted all day. And they would spend much time reading the Old Testament. They actually would read three different parts of the Old Testament. There would be a reading from the Old Testament law, And then they would stand up and talk about what they had just read. And then someone would read from the Old Testament prophets. And then they would stand up and talk about what they had read. And then later on, someone would read from uh, the writings. And then they would talk about what they had read. That's what's taking place as Jesus enters into the synagogue. Someone has already read from the Old Testament law, and now it's time for the reading of the prophets. And for some reason, Jesus is selected to do the reading. Jesus stands up. The attendant hands him the scriptures. They didn't have Bibles like you and I have today. It was handed a scroll, and he had to unroll the scroll. And as he unrolled the scroll, he he found the passage of scripture that was assigned for him to read on that day. And the passage that was assigned for him to read was Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. So would you do me a favor, put your finger in Luke chapter 4, if you have your Bible, and turn back with me to Isaiah chapter 61. And I want us to look at the passage that Jesus was given to read on this day in the synagogue. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. This is what Jesus read as he stood in the synagogue that day. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim the captives would be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn the time of the Lord's favor has come. Now, if you compare Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2 with Luke chapter 4, the passage that we're reading today, you'll notice that Jesus doesn't finish verse 2. He stops in the middle where after it says that the time of the Lord's favor 
has come. Verse 2 goes on and says, and with it, the day of God's anger against their enemies. And then verse 3, to all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, a festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his glory. Here's what I want you to catch, and then we're going to apply it. The first is this. Isaiah 61, verse 1, and the first part of verse 2 detail the events surrounding the Messiah's first coming. All right? So when Jesus stands up and reads that passage of Scripture, he's reading a prophetic passage that detail the first coming of the Messiah. Just to complete your notes, Isaiah chapter 61, the second part of verse 2, and verse 3, detail the events surrounding the Messiah's second coming. You see, we believe that Jesus not only came the first time, but Jesus is coming a second time. The first time Jesus came, he came offering salvation. The second time he comes, though, he comes bringing judgment. And you see that in the passage. And so as Jesus stands up and gives his purpose statement, as he's talking about what is the purpose for his life and ministry, he takes this passage of Scripture and basically here's what he's saying. I am coming on this occasion, on this trip, to bring salvation. Now remember, Jesus said he was coming again. Remember in John chapter 14 and verse 6, before he left, he told the disciples, I'm going to go away, but if I go away, I'm coming again. In his second coming, he doesn't come for salvation, but in the second coming, he comes to bring condemnation to those who have not put their faith and trust in him. And so the first thing we see is that the passage that Jesus reads comes from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The second thing we see, though, is this. The passage that Jesus was given to read is the mission statement for his ministry. You see, the verses that Jesus were given to read, were given to read was not just about anybody. It was about him. I mean, these were prophetic words that were about him. Now, you might sit back today and say, come on, Brian, you're making a big leap to make such a claim. But that truth is clearly dedicated or demonstrated in today's passage because after Jesus finished reading, and I wish we could put ourselves there in the synagogue and, and watch what was taking place. A synagogue, in order to have a synagogue, there only had to be 10 men in a community. Nazareth was a small community. So there probably were only 10 or 15 men in Nazareth, when Jesus read that passage, and the text says that he handed the scroll back to the attendant. It's interesting. It says, and he sat down. You see, teachers in New Testament times sat while the people that they were teaching stood. Do you, do you want to try that this morning? I'll sit down and you now. Nah, you want to try that this morning, okay. Jesus sat down, and it said all eyes were on him. You see, the custom was to read the passage and then to make a comment on the passage. This was a passage that was well known to the people in the synagogue there. They were very familiar with the Messianic prophecies because it had been read for years and whoever read that passage would read it and then make some reference to the coming of the Messiah. We're looking forward to the day when the Messiah comes and fulfills this passage. But that's not what Jesus said that day. As Jesus read the passage, handed it to the attendant, sat down, all the eyes were intently on him. Jesus made this statement. He said, the words that I just read have been fulfilled this very day. Do you catch what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of those Old Testament prophecies. I am the Messiah. Jesus was making a very strong messianic claim at that moment. He was telling those 10 or 15 or 20 men that he was the long-awaited. He was the much prophesied. He was the Messiah that was coming to save Israel, that was coming to save men. Jesus was the fulfillment of that prophecy. Now, 
I want you to catch that. Would you go back, grab your Bibles once again, and go back to Luke chapter 14, and I want to reread verses 18 and 19. And what I want to do is every time the word me is found, I want to insert the name Jesus because it's referring to him. So here's what Jesus was saying and explaining this passage. The Spirit of the Lord is upon Jesus, for he has anointed Jesus to bring good news to the poor. He has sent Jesus to proclaim that captives will be released and that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. You see, no one else could fulfill this prophecy. It referred to Jesus, and it referred to Jesus alone. Israel had had thousands of leaders. They'd had hundreds of of prophets, but Jesus was the only one who completely fulfilled this prophecy. I don't know whether you get as excited about Scripture as I do. I read that, and that kind of sends a, a tingle up and down my spine, that, that the exact passage that Jesus was given to read on that day was his mission statement. You can sit back and say, man, Brian, what a coincidence. That wasn't a coincidence. Jesus was beginning his public ministry. And here Jesus not only tells those men that he was the Messiah and that he was beginning his public ministry, but he declares to them what he was about to do. And he lists six things in the passage that define his ministry. This is his mission statement. Notice it with me this morning. The first thing he says is this. He came to give the good news to the poor. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. Now, who was Jesus referring to? Was he speaking of the less fortunate, the underprivileged of society? Although Jesus had a tremendous love for those that were suffering financial hardships, in this passage, he's not referring to the monetarily destitute. The Greek word that's used in the passage means utter helplessness. It means complete destitution. The word means those that are afflicted, those that are distressed. And the word good news, by the way, refers to the message of the gospel, the fact that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. That is good news. Let me pause for a second, and I cannot jump over that, because here we find the most important message of the gospel, what Jesus describes the good news. The good news very simply is this, that Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and three days later he rose again. And that good news is available to each and every one of us because we, in our own condition, are sinners and we cannot save ourselves. And the good news is that even though we are helpless and lost and spiritually destitute, that Jesus came and he offers salvation to those of us who could have never, ever deserved it. You know what that is? That's grace. That's what we sang about today. Grace. God giving us what we could never, ever deserve. And here Jesus says, listen, my mission statement is to share the good news with those that desperately need it. So this morning, it doesn't matter what you're going through, if you're helpless, if you're destitute, if you're afflicted, if you're distressed with something, the good news of the gospel is available to each and every one of us. And I trust that you've embraced that. And we certainly want to make it clear here at Hollywood Community Church that attending Hollywood Community Church Sunday after Sunday is not enough to save you. You must put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. You must embrace the good news of the gospel. Jesus said, I came to proclaim good news. And by the way, let me just pause there and say this. Just as Jesus' mission was to proclaim good news, your mission and my mission is to proclaim good news as well. 
And I'm afraid that very often we don't take the opportunity to share the good news of the gospel with others. We want to give you an opportunity to do that. We have this, uh, this little pamphlet called Now That I Have Believed. And I think Howard has these. The conclusion of the service, Howard's going to have about 100 of these or maybe more at the back. I'd encourage you to grab one or two and make a determination to share this with somebody during the course of the week. Share the good news with someone. Jesus says, I've come to give good news to the poor. He says the second thing. He says that he came to heal the brokenhearted. Now you might say, wait a second, Brian, I didn't read that in the passage. Unfortunately, that's not found in in the New Living Translation. If you have an older translation, a King James or a New King James, it's in that translation. It is found in Isaiah chapter 61, where it says this, the servant of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord has come upon Jesus for the purpose of healing the brokenhearted. Let me ask you this morning, have you ever had a broken heart? Did you ever lose someone close to you? Did you ever miss out on an opportunity that was important to you? Did you ever lose a job that you really liked? Did you ever go through a nasty divorce? Or have you ever been separated from your kids? All of us have experienced a broken heart. Allow Jesus to be the heart restorer. Jesus said, I have come to mend to heal the broken hearted. It's really interesting, the word heal there in the passage means the stitch. And the idea of uh, you know, a hole there and someone stitches a hole. Jesus says, man, I've come to take those holes, those broken hearted holes in your life and I've come to stitch them up and I've come to heal them. Jesus said that he came to proclaim liberty to the captives. The idea being that Jesus came to free those that are in bondage. You ever felt chained and imprisoned by your sinful actions? Many of us have. Here's a couple of great verses. I'm going to put them up on the screen. Psalm 107. I'd encourage you to read this later. Psalm 107, beginning in verse 10. The psalmist says this. Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom imprisoned in iron chains of misery. They rebelled against the words of God, scorning the counsel of the Most High. That is why He broke them with hard labor. They fell, and no one was there to help them. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble. And He saved them from their distress. He led them from the darkness and the deepest gloom. He snapped their chains Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wondrous things he has done for them. For he broke down their prison gates of bronze. He cut apart their bars of iron. Here's the idea. Jesus has come to set you free. Jesus said, I've come that they might be free and that they might be free indeed. Is there a sin that has a grip on your life? Jesus came to remove the shackles and to free you from the bondage of sin. The next thing he mentions is to give sight to the blind. This, quite honestly, might be a reference to the three blind men that Jesus healed throughout his life. More likely, though, Jesus is referring to those who are spiritually blind. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says this, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. Do you ever ever wonder why why some people embrace the message of the gospel? And some people sit back and act like it's crazy. It's like fairy tales. They just don't want to embrace it. The Apostle Paul says, they're blinded to the truth of the gospel. They have an enemy that has deceived them, that has blinded them, and they cannot see, they cannot appreciate the glorious light of the good news. Jesus said, man, I've come to give sight to the blind, to liberate those who are oppressed. It is our enemy that most often oppresses believers, and quite frankly, if our enemy cannot internally indwell you, and by the way, he cannot indwell believers, he will externally oppress them, attempting to make their lives miserable. Jesus has come to liberate us from the power 
of the devil. James said it in James 4. We looked at it this past Wednesday. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The last thing Jesus reads is he says this. I've come to announce the time of the Lord's favor. I love, for some reason, I just love the word favor. And Jesus says, you know what? The time of God's favor has come. And I have come to announce that. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, God has awaited this time. As Satan wreaked havoc on mankind, God patiently waited, knowing that Jesus' time was coming. And here is Jesus stands in the synagogue. This is what he says, to say it in the shortest possible way. Shortest possible way. He looks at the crowd, and here's what he says. It's time. It's time. Are you ready? That long-awaited moment of God has come. It's time for my ministry to begin. It's time for the work of God to be completed. As Jesus stood before them, he emphatically stated that his time had come. The long-awaited, the long-awaited moment of God's plan for eternal redemption would finally be put into place. And as Jesus reads that passage, he stands up and gives his own mission statement. Let me pause for just a second and say this. The next thing that I wrote in the notes is this. Jesus' ministry statement is a pattern of how you and I should minister to others. Our challenge is to minister just as Jesus ministered. We should love those that Jesus loved. We should minister to those to whom Jesus ministered. We must not ignore the poor. We must not ignore the chained, the bind, or the chained, the blind, and the oppressed, both figuratively and spiritually. They're folks to whom we must minister. We don't share with you as often as we should, but here's the purpose statement of Hollywood Community Church, and kind of have, uh, kind of love to have you read it, and if you can memorize it, memorize it. It's very short. It's very succinct. Hollywood Community Church exists to glorify God, make disciples, and serve others. That's why we exist. Would you say that with me today? Hollywood Community Church exists to glorify God, make disciples, and serve others others. Say it with me one more time. Hollywood Community Church exists to glorify God, make disciples, and serve others. That's what we've been called to do. We've said that as succinctly as possible, and our goal is to line up that with the mission statement of Jesus Christ. There's one more thing in the passage, and I know our time is almost gone, but I want you to see this. Like Jesus, we will encounter opposition. Like Jesus, we didn't read verses 20 through through, 22 through 30, but in my mind, it's actually the most fascinating part of the chapter. Because it says that Jesus said that, and he said, today, this is being fulfilled in, 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 in your midst. And then it says, the crowd said really nice things about him. And Jesus' response was, and I find it very interesting, Jesus' response wasn't like the old parade wave. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm the fulfillment of all of that. Throw your compliments this way. I will receive them. That's not what Jesus did. As a matter of fact, if you read this, you're going to sit back and think, what in the world was Jesus doing? Because he takes these seemingly nice comments of the people who were in the synagogue with him, and he almost turns the tables on them. They said nice things about him, and then Jesus' response is almost weird. All right, I'm, I'm saying that not blaspheming, but it's completely unexpected. Verse 23, if you have your Bibles, then Jesus said, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Meaning, do miracles here in this hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Then he goes through and tells two stories of how the power of God was demonstrated not to the people of God, but how the power of God was demonstrated to Israel's enemies. And the people who were in the synagogue turned on Jesus on a dime. I mean, the same ones who were admiring him began to curse him. 
The same ones who were saying great things about Jesus all of a sudden turned on him. Verse 28, when they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. They jumped up. They mobbed him. They forced him to the edge of a hill on which the town was built, and they intended to push him off the cliff. (laughs) Catch what's happening. These people who were admirers all of a sudden became murderers. The people who were followers of Jesus all of a sudden became enemies of Jesus. You say, Brian, how long of a time period? Just a matter of a few moments. The thoughts, the reaction of the crowd completely changed. You say, Brian, why is that? What in the world happened? Very simply, they didn't hear what they wanted to hear. The message that Jesus gave them was not the message that they wanted to hear. Man, church, we need to realize that when we stand up and we teach the truth of the message of the gospel, it will not be a popular message. I've written in your notes, Jesus' mission does not conform to man's preconceptions, plans, and programs. You see, here's what they wanted. Man, Jesus, we're so glad you're here in Nazareth. Heal somebody. Come on, do something magical. We want to see you perform your magic. They were admirers of Jesus. They weren't followers of Jesus. They weren't dedicated to him. They were there for the loaves and the fishes. They were there for what they could get out of him. And when the message of Jesus changed, boom, they changed, and they were out the door. As a matter of fact, Jesus even says that his mission of love and grace is to be extended even to those that we consider to be our enemies. The last thing I wrote in my notes is this. Jesus' mission will anger those who are not completely dedicated to him. Let us not be surprised that when we do the ministry of Jesus, that when we do his ministry, Jesus' way, there'll be opposition. Here's three questions for thought, and I'm done today. So we're trying to wrap this up and we apply it to our lives. Here's three questions that I'd love to have you, have you ask yourself this morning. Question number one is this. Have you been healed, set free, and liberated by the good news of the gospel? Has there been a time in your life in which you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and you were set free from your sins? If that's never happened in your life, I don't want to burst your bubble. We want you to come to Hollywood Community Church, but being religious will never, ever cut it. You need by faith to trust in Jesus Christ and the finished work of Christ on the cross. Here's the second thing. Does your mission statement match up with Jesus' mission statement? You see, the way you're living your life, the way you're directing your life, does it match up with his? Or are you on your own? Man, you're out there in left field doing what you want to do, and your life in no way corresponds with what Jesus says here in Luke chapter 4. You see, the challenge is to match our mission statement with his. So the last question is this. What can you do to get on mission with Jesus? See, here's the challenge. He not only came to save us and free us from the fires of hell, he came to make disciples. And disciples are followers of Jesus who were active in his mission. Church, I want to challenge you. I want to light a fire under you. Let's not just be hearers. Let's be doers. Let's not just be supporters and wave the flag. Let's be involved in the mission. Let's make sure that his mission statement or our mission statement matches his mission statement.